and we particularly love the King James Version, I, I absolutely refuse to let text, textual absolutists claim the label of loving the King James more. I love it. I'm so grateful for it. I grew up on it. We want to affirm expertise is needed, but the goal of expertise is to serve the church and through the church to serve those who aren't even yet part of the church. We want to be so careful today to honor the work of the Spirit that he does through imperfect people, imperfect translators, imperfect textual critics, and not to look at that and take something that's the work of the Spirit and accuse it of being the work of the devil. This is God's Word we're dealing with, and we don't need to cut corners. You are listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. Guys, we have covered a lot of ground in our previous six discussions. For those of us, uh, those people listening who uh, might not remember all that long time ago, we certainly don't. That was the beginning of the day. What we were talking about, Tim, you're going to have to look at your notes. What did we talk about in uh, sessions one through four? Um, in those first couple of sessions after our intro, we broadly canvassed the history of textual absolutism how our uh, heuristic of seeing kind of three positions on the text can actually be shown throughout the long history of the church, long before the King James or the TR came about. Then we talked specifically about um, the modern manifestations of textual absolutism and the theology that so often drives it. And the Bible texts people use. Yeah, too. Bible texts that get used. And we looked at them closely enough to say that we, we think they're, it's valid to say that God has preserved his word for sure, but the text doesn't point us to an abs absolutist understanding of preservation. And then we zoom, zoomed in to talk specifically about uh, the creation of the TR and the King James Version in those first three sessions. Yeah, then we had a real shift where we went from uh, mostly Tim and I talking about the stuff that we focused on, and really especially Tim, to the wonderful nerdy stuff that Elijah Hickson and Peter Montoro are experts in. Why don't you review those two sessions for us, Peter? Yeah, so we talked about in uh, session five, the materials for textual confidence. And we really just went through, okay, we're, we're, we're arguing you know, that a uh, toil and trust belong together. So what needs to be toiled on? Erasmus talked about, you know, this pious labor of working to improve the text. Well, what, what has God given us to, to improve the text with? And so we talked about manuscripts and other sources for textual information. We talked about, you know, learning um, what scribes do with the text, the sorts of mistakes that they make and, and what we're trying to, when we do text criticism, what are we trying to accomplish? So we talked about that. And then you know, in the last session, we talked about the trajectory of textual confidence. We talked about the long story that this work didn't, you know, start at some point. You know, we went back to the second century, one of our earliest writings from Christianity after the New Testament, you know, within, um, you know, Irenaeus knows people who knew some of the apostles um, very, quite plausibly. And he claims that he did, and there's no reason to, to doubt him because the chronology fits. Uh, and he's already dealing with multiple manuscripts and he's saying, let's go with the oldest and best copies uh, because the scribes made a mistake in the other ones. Um, and, 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 and so we saw the trajectory that that continues, uh, you know, in uh, manuscripts themselves uh, and then also, you know, all the way down. And Westcott and Hort, certainly, you know, for the reasons, you know, Tim gave, it's, it's a significant uh, chapter in the story, uh, but it's neither the beginning nor the end of the story of textual criticism. Um, and so really, we, we ended with that broad trajectory um, that... Uh, textual toil and textual trust belong together. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, as both textual absolutists on the one hand and textual skeptics on the other, they both agree in saying um, that if God didn't do things the way we want him to do them, then he must not have done them at all. Um, and so, you know, they come to opposite conclusions, but the logic is the same. And we want to reject that logic uh, rather than just the surface level conclusions. We want to reject that inner logic of absolutism um, across the board. And so we started our first session, though. Uh, well, see, that's for you. Yeah, we're going to get into that. But actually, first, I am contractually obligated to first thank Patreon supporters who have helped me come here. And I have made sure to pay for the meals of our videographer, Josh, that you can't see. Maybe he'll show a picture of himself at some point. He's going to edit all this. We're really grateful for his work. I also want to thank that Christian cow who died for the TBS Westminster <laughs> Reference Edition cover and the Christian chickens who work for Chick-fil-A who died <laughs> to make our lunch possible. 
And now moving on, let's go well, back. Let's, uh, I want to. I want to give some some thank yous. If oh we're yeah, doing that. Well, okay, go I ahead. I want to uh, thank uh, my church, Westside Baptist Church, that uh, it is my privilege to be the preaching pastor at, uh, and for the support that they give to my work uh, through supporting me as a pastor and uh, enabling me to go on trips like this, and to all the sacrifices that my wife Ashley has made um, and our children have made for me to do the crazy thing of being in a PhD program and. Uh, uh, the pastor of a church at the same time. I didn't plan it that way, but uh, it so happened in God's providence that I had just started uh, a PhD program uh, when the their yeah. previous preaching pastor resigned. And uh, it, in the Lord's providence, he, he led me to, to take on that responsibility without quitting what I had been doing before. Yeah, whereas the textual absolutist view would be a lot easier for you. There would be no textual critical work to be done, so you wouldn't have to be doing this. Right. Yeah. Switch, convert, convert. Yeah. <laughs> Tim. And, and, and so I just want to I just want to thank you know, thank all the the members of our church and, and my family and I want to thank thank my parents even though sure. they would disagree with a lot or almost all of what I've said uh, in this this series of sure. podcasts it was really my parents who gave me a love for the Word of God right. who sent me to reading the Bible right. and loving the Bible and loving what the Bible said and and I owe a debt to that and I'm I'm grateful for that and I'm you know I'm just I just want to want to give my thanks for that yeah. Tim, please thank your wife on our behalf. What did she I do for us? I most definitely will. I'm thankful for my wife's love and patience and grace with me all all the time and all together. But today in particular, she's just served in so many helpful, and she can't hear me, but so many helpful and humble ways, getting us things, waiting patiently outside for the whole time. All and I'm, I'm so long. deeply grateful for her graciousness. And I'll say also some of what Peter said. I, I disagree so fundamentally with where, for example, my mom and dad are at. But I'm grateful for their spiritual influence in my life. They handed me a King James Bible, reared me on it, and I've been faithfully reading it ever since. And, and, and somewhat the same as Peter said, they would be very unhappy with where I'm at and even what all I've said today if they were to hear it. And I don't know that they will. Uh, but in some sense, they've always wanted me to tell more people about the King James Bible, and I'm, I'm fulfilling at least that part of their <laughs> dreams for me. Right. Um, and, and, you know, a serious prayer request. We, we can't mention grown sons, Christian sons, disagreements with their parents over such divisive things without saying, please pray. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of people who watch my channel are affected by this in their families. Their families yeah. are literally broken up over this divisive issue. And I think often of Galatians 5, man, I think of it so mm -hmm. often that the works of the flesh include division, contention, right. and strife. Now, of course, if we're wrong, then b I, before the Lord, I have to admit, we could be guilty of the same thing, but yeah. by his grace, we don't think we're wrong. We are trying to be peacemakers. And uh, the source of this division is, in our judgment, a false teaching of textual absolutism. And you've, you're listening to guys who've had to pay a real price. I haven't lost family relationships, but I have lost uh, Christian friendships over this, people that I went to school with that I think would be happy to be my friend if I were still right. holding to King James onlyism, but I just can't do it in good conscience. And I do, uh, I won't name names, but I, I specifically lament that loss sometimes. So we all thank all the people that supported us. Elijah, come on. Who are you going to thank? But yeah, I, I would like to thank um, the people who are letting us use facilities. There's some great uh, Christians in Dallas, and uh, we've been able to, to use. We had a, this, is, this was a plan B, I think. We, we had one, and then that fell through. And, but thankfully, there was somebody else who, who let us in, and that was really great of them. And also, um, my job at CSNTM, I do have so a little bit of time every week to do non-CSNTM-related work. Um, and so I'm very thankful that I'm able to, to, to take that time today and, and be here and use that for that purpose. So it's still, we're still talking text criticism. Uh, there's still a relevance there, even if this is not something directly related to my job. Right, and, and all the donors who've given money for all of this, we're trying to do good for Christ's body, and so are we. So let's do some more. Let's review our key takeaways. Let's go back, actually, to the five takeaways that at the beginning we said we hoped people would get in light of all the stuff that we've covered and so much gory detail in some cases. Let's go over those again. Elijah, you start us like you did before. Yeah, uh, We would just want everyone to renew their commitment to the truth. Uh, this is God's word we're dealing with. And we don't need to cut corners. Absolutely. Yeah. Peter, you you take up we number want, two. We want, to every, we want everyone to remember the scriptures belong to the plowboys as well as to the pastors. And, you know, more broadly, we want to affirm expertise is needed, but the goal of expertise is to serve the church and through the church to serve those who aren't even yet part of the church. 
so that somebody could pick up a Bible and read it and maybe not understand everything, but understand enough of the power so that the power of God's word can come through. And our job as scholars or aspiring scholars is to clear away those obstacles um, so that the power can come through. Uh, and we want to say, let that work be done. Right. And then I, I would add there, uh, uh, just to recap, we want to be really careful to remember that the comforter that Jesus promised has never left his church, which means two things. It means on the one hand, we don't want to frame a position about the Bible that would steal the Bible from earlier ages before, say, the King James Bible came along. And secondly, it means that we want to be so careful today to honor the work of the Spirit that he does through imperfect people, imperfect translators, imperfect textual critics, and not to look at that and take something that's the work of the Spirit and accuse it of being the work of the devil. Yeah, there's something that fills me with dread to see people talk that way. And I'll uh, give mine again. I still feel exactly this way like I did when we started. I want everyone to grow in their appreciation for the work of the King James translators. And how can you grow in that appreciation without understanding what they did, including some of those niceties, which uh, included textual criticism. And I, I found it so helpful. I'm borrowing a little bit from the next session here, uh, part of our session, but I found it so helpful for you, Tim, to lay out um, the preface in a way that I'd had trouble understanding. Like, it's so thick. The, the language is so difficult. I've translated it for others. I've worked through it multiple times, and I was able to see a ton of great individual points, but the overall sweep of it was a little more difficult for me to grasp until you helped. <clears throat> and that gave me a greater appreciation for the work of the King James translators, especially to situate them in, yeah, in their, in their history. I thought that was so helpful. Mm, good. Peter, you wrap us up. We'll remind us of that last cake. We want everyone to grow in their confidence in the scriptures as God's word. Like this, you know, if this is heard as an attack on the Bible, yeah. then I just, I can't characterize that as anything other than a deliberate misunderstanding of what's taking place. Right. It's malice. It's, yeah, it's a malicious, it a malicious and deliberate misunderstanding. We love the Bible, all of us in this room, and, and want people to trust it. And we particularly love the King James Version. Yeah. I, I absolutely refuse to let text, textual absolutists claim the label of loving the King James more. Yeah. I love it. I'm right. so grateful for it. I grew up on it. Funny story, my wife and I, when we did our elopement not too long ago, we had my brother-in-law, the minister, use and hold my New Cambridge Paragraph King James Bible. Like, what, what text do you want to frame the whole rest of your life together? I wanted a King James Bible there. That's excellent. So let's, uh, in the interest of keeping this one short, <laughs> go back around the, I can't say circle, I'm going to have to say parallelogram, <laughs> um, and review what we learned uh, this is just spontaneous, guys, and it doesn't have to be everybody who says only one thing. I kind of already started a minute ago saying I felt like Tim especially brought something out for me there. I'm going to start again because I've got another one. I really feel that what you said, Tim, about why 1881 seems so epical, why is it treated both by the mainstream, the textual confidence you know, crowd that, that we uh, claim, and by the textual absolutists in the King James Only world, why do, they, why do we all see it as so significant? And it was, it's so helpful to situate that in the historical time frame and see that it's because those three streams came together where you had not only um, uh, the text of the Greek New Testament, but annotations, textual critical annotations on the Greek New Testament and English translation all in essence, changing, you know, at, at once. And therefore, that's why it seems epical. But those things had never stopped. They'd been going on, actually, really, before Erasmus, but especially with Erasmus, and then all the way through. That, that changed my picture. You know, I, I can't say radically, obviously, but it helped me put something together that I hadn't seen before. That is something that I learned. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll jump in and say, uh, more of a spiritual lesson learned or just appreciated listening to Elijah read from Robinson and Pierpoint. That was and great. Deep devotional love for the word and sharing about Dirk as well, losing sleep, talking for days about the spelling of a, a word that's going to go into an edition. Such deep reverence for scripture. I want that to be my heart. That yes. inspires me. That blesses me. Yes. Um, and I, I want to replicate it in my life. That's great. Well, I, I never hear you say anything when I don't learn about it. Like, you know the, the history of the King James and Erasmus and all of everything in that era better than anybody I've ever, mm. I've ever met or, 
are read. Um, and so I, I appreciate all the details of different things that you brought out. And when you kind of speak off the top of your head, that's when we get something particularly great that you hadn't <laughs> planned to say, but it's all in your head. And, you know, when you let it out, I, I always learn something. So I appreciate that. The Textual Confidence Collective Mutual Admiration Society is now in session. We are grateful for the gifts that God has given to all of us. That's great. Peter? I, I, I Well, just in keeping with what, what seems to be a theme, uh, I, I've learned a lot from Tim about, even in the context of this podcast uh, and, and going, or these videos and podcasts going through this, you know, it's been some things I haven't read about in, in a long time and lots of things I never knew, you know, that I've learned from Tim, you know, mm -hmm. and from all of you, from all of you all, this has been a great, you know, this has been a great learning experience and I'm, I'm really really enjoyed it. Amen. Yeah, well, let, let's not leave Peter and Elijah out. Um, that topic, uh, the all of New Testament textual criticism, um, it can be dry. Yeah. There are a lot of minor details. Elijah, during the break, was talking about a paper that he unfortunately had to hear all about typos within <laughs> the ECM oh, on I, Mark. I thought it was hilarious. Oh, you, you <laughs> yeah. liked it? I, I actually did. <laughs> okay. I, I know the author and it's just so fitting. Like it's absolutely what you would I expect. see. That's great. Was, well, but you guys, Peter and Elijah, I, I feel like um, you haven't lost sight of the end goal here. There, yeah. There is a kind of scholarship that just gets so mm. lost in the weeds, yeah. you know, and some of that is necessary, you know, if you're ever going to come out with anything valuable, but some people just stay lost and you didn't, you found details that take years and years to find. You have to spend right. years setting up the framework by which it, you can understand this stuff, learning the languages that are relevant, learning about Greek Orthodox bibliology so you can understand the contribution of some scribe in Mount Athos. Uh, and yet you came, you know, your scribes coming out, bringing out treasures new and old, um, details that really are relevant that fill out that historical picture. That's where I have always tended to be weakest is in the history. I like philology. I like words. So I was really appreciative of both of you guys bringing yeah. out historical stuff. Anybody else before we move on? I just on? wanted to jump in like really Mark's book, your book authorized has yes. done so much good. Like I, yeah. it is done. I have talked to so many people that just your spirit, your gentle spirit. And I'd say this for you, you know, for all you all you guys, your willingness to take nastiness and, and dish out kindness mm. um, has been an inspiration to me. Um, and it's made, it's making a difference. And, and by God's grace, that difference that you've begun to make, and really in, in some ways it was your book that, that pulled, you know, so I was friends with yeah. Tim and it, it kind of your book though was the one that pulled this together right. to start out with, to extend some of the work that you had done and, and take it into some new areas. And that, you know, by God's grace, my prayer is that this, this series of conversations that we've had is going to have that same effect yeah. and, just and amplify it, it yeah. even further um, and in new areas and, and, and to, to keep the conversation going in a way that benefits Christ church and benefits ultimately pastors and people in the pew. Yeah. I, I mean, I resisted talking about textual criticism on my YouTube channel successfully for two years. I did one time allow myself to put up a video, which is a couple months ago of, of a talk on Scrivener. Um, and I resisted it in part because I just didn't feel that I had uh, done the necessary work, not so much on New Testament textual criticism, but on popularization of it, on teaching it to people. Um, and especially on how do I teach it to people who've been influenced by textual absolutism. So I felt that bringing us all together would be a way to remedy, you know, basically my weaknesses. And I feel very glad. I mean, my, my prayers are answered. Um, the many, 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 many pastors from the King James only world that are all around my age and younger who've contacted me over the last four years now, especially the last two since my YouTube channel came out. Um, they are on my heart and they have asked me repeatedly, okay, like I get your perspective and I'm not King James only anymore because I know we need to understand the Bible. First Corinthians 14, dead words and false friends are definitely a problem. But now what do I do? Because I really still don't know what to make of all this textual critical stuff. And even when I say to them what, what I say in the book and what nearly none of my textual absolutist friends have registered, unfortunately, I say, I'm neutral on that question in this book. Like, yeah, I'm not personally neutral. I favor the critical text. 
But in this book, for the purposes of this book, it's totally fine if you want to stick with the TR. And I still think that it's the textual absolutist side that's saying that the differences are massive. We're not saying the differences are massive. We're saying only because it's God wor God's word is it significant. are the differences significant enough that it's worth going through the trouble uh, of possibly riling people up to use a more accurate text. Um, but uh, so people have gotten that message and I tell them it's really okay if you use the new King James or the, or the modern English version, but then to their credit, I think these young pastors, they want to know more and they have started to realize, you know, I'm not sure that I was told the truth. And I, and I think one of their motivations is they do want to re-achieve unity with Christ's body. Uh, they don't want to unnecessarily divide from other Christians over uh, textual criticism. So I'm praying and I invite anybody listening or watching to pray along with all of us. And we pray before every session. I'm praying that the good that Christ will do for his body um, is rescuing people to and restoring them to unity with, with Christ's body. So I've already handled and authorized the readability stuff. Um, and if people stop there, I'm actually okay with that. Read the New King James the rest of your life and I won't be upset as long as you don't divide over it. Um, but if people want to go further, I do think there is a lot of reward there. And I think that you guys have, uh, helped me help my audience in that space and help me reach a new audience too, uh, to, to go, to go further. Anything else that stands out to you? What, what you learn? I mean, we covered so much detail. I think we're ready, uh, just for the sake of time, even to continue on to resources for further study. Let's do it. What could scholars and potential scholars and wannabe scholars enjoy more than recommending books amen so we, we bought love some, books can i hear a witness <laughs> we bought we brought a witness we brought, i'm a witness where's the I'm amen a, then? i'm a tired witness <laughs> and i'm a rather stiff witness like i'm not a big oh, amen say sir. Amen. i'm really sorry i'll say it very quietly in greek amen <laughs> I am so so you're persuaded you've listened to all this where do you turn to learn more um can I I will start and my friend Peter Gurry he's the friend to all of us you know I shouldn't be saying this Elijah should be saying this but mm. I was one of the first people to write. Did I write for the Text and Canon website before you did, Elijah? Do you know? I don't know. I, I wrote. Think yours was one of the very first. I art. think mine was one of the very first. So I get I to wrote say mine like a year before it was published. Oh, yeah. oh man. Ah, oh well. Anyway, I still get to say, <gasps> Text and Canon website is at textandcanon.org is a fantastic place to go. Um, I used to send people to our next uh, recommendation, the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog, and it is a great place. It is incredibly nerdy. Mm -hmm. It's not meant for uh, most yeah. people. It's for and, specialists. Can I yeah. speak to that? Yeah, yeah go I'm ahead. I'm a blog member there. Yeah. I, I'm one of the bloggers. And I've written articles for them. Um, I, it's one of the places where I started out because I just thought I need to learn more about this. Uh, and I started reading and I didn't understand any of it. It was drinking from the fire hose and I just yeah. kept with it. And I thought if I keep doing it and I keep trying, eventually I might understand a little bit of it. And yeah. eventually it did happen. But it was a fire hose of sweet tea, and so you stuck with it. <laughs> right. Because you love that. Okay. Peter, you're going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that was where I started. Like, I think a lot of people, like, we've had an incredible revival of conservative evangelicals yeah. doing text criticism, and so much of it goes back to, you know, Pete read, if I remember the origin story right, Pete read Ehrman's book and got mad about it and said, we should, we, we, we should be the ones doing this work and started this blog, and it's just taken off after that. Uh, with people contributing, and it's really become a hub for, it's a nerdy place, it's a very nerdy place, but, but it's become a hub for people so doing the kind of work. Text and Canon, their site is just as responsible, it's a lot right, of the same right. guys, but more accessible. It's still, you know, there's still a level of academic demandingness, but I think it's really pitched really well to the they've kind done, of people. They've done it broken, like, you know, introductory, intermediate, yeah, You can advanced. search either level of oh, articles. I didn't even yeah, realize so they have that. It, so they have it so you can look just for, for stuff at different levels. That I thought that was really Like cool. yeah. Reese Robinson's is a higher academic level, so it's full of footnotes, but you yeah. can also click on a lower academic level. That's and there's broader degree. than just, tech, you know, deal with questions of canon. So that, that'd right. be a really useful site. And I'm, right. yeah. I'm really excited uh, that that um, Gurry and Mead are coming out with a book with Crossway on how yeah. we got the Bible, yeah. it's going to be, that's going to be where you I'm going to send you. order it now and I think get 50% yeah, off. I've got it on my laptop right here. I actually tried to get that book for Lexham Press. Mm. Met John Mead at, and 
Peter Gary at um, ETS and failed, but I love Crossway too, so um, I'm so glad for them to have well, I'm, success. I'm, I'm, I, have, I have to say I'm happy it's with Crossway because they are so easy to work with for local church bookstores. Mm. Oh, and that's nice. They, they are just very – anyway, that's mm. – Elijah, the CSNTM <laughs> website, what can people expect to find there? Uh, whatever our programmer puts up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I, I am not responsible for what's on the website. It's not my – job at csntm but we have pictures of lots of manuscripts and that's important why uh because we want to know what the bible is and what the bible was for people and what the witnesses are for the bible today and, and similarly to my kjv parallel bible.org i think and that's certainly something i would recommend if you will if you are troubled by all this even still after listening to all the jawing that we've done for hours and hours um, one of the best things you can do is just go look at it. And I find kjvparallelbible.org is in English. If you happen to know Greek, you can go to CSNTM's website or the INTF and you'll just search for INTF and, and you'll find uh, uh, more and more images of Greek manuscripts and something about seeing the actual physical Bible that somebody in a church or some uh, individual Christian wealthy, well, I don't know, use or just a page or a scrap it just comforts me like, okay, this, this doesn't have to be so scary. This is somebody doing the same thing in their day, basically, that I'm doing in mine, just trying to read God's word. And in on the KJV Parallel Bible site, I've actually, with the help of, did any of you guys help? I forget. I can't remember. I don't even know if I knew you when I was doing that project. But I basically took, there's, there's the Bible, the King James New Testament in two columns. On the left is the King James as it stands, uh, in the 1769 edition. Um, it's actually the 1900 edition that I got from Lagos, and Tim knows way more about that. But anyways, um, it's, based, it's based on the Texas Receptus, as it were. And then I did a thought experiment. What if I got in a time machine and I brought the NA28 critical text back to the King James translators, tra translators in 1604 and handed it to them? What would the King James New Testament look like? And so I, And then I bolded all the differences. So you can see in English with everything else being equal, the same, what the differences are between the main te te uh, Texas Receptus edition used today and the main uh, critical text used today. And I think if you will give a fair look, you will see first off that what jumps out is that the texts are overwhelmingly similar. Second off, what jumps out, the places where they're different those differences are almost always incredibly minor. Let's talk about, we, I said we're going to talk about books. Now we've talked about websites. Let's talk about books. Who's got a book they want to recommend? Can I, I get to start again. Um, Authorize has already been mentioned. And of course I do recommend that book. Um, but lest I be um, tooting my own horn too much, I want to talk about this one. Um, An Introduction to the Greek New Testament by Dirk Yonkind. I reviewed this for the Logos blog a couple years ago and I was really taken with it. I wasn't sure what to expect. At first I thought it was going to be really specific to the THGNT that we've been talking about. It is not. Um, certainly mentions it, but it's a fantastic, faithful, evangelical from Crossway introduction to New we Testament. Talked about, we talked about Dirk, and Dirk is, yeah. Dirk is amazing. Introduction I, to New Testament textual criticism. I do want to point, there's one scribal error. Uh-oh. My name is misspelled yes. in the acknowledgments. I'm no. sorry. That's true. But, that's <laughs> but apart a, from that, apart from the think, acknowledgments, it's amazing. Do you think a, it was a theologically motivated corruption? <laughs> no, I don't think so. That's a great humble way to mention that you got acknowledged there, Peter. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. It's such a great introduction. I love I love the I love the books. I love I love the book. It is amazing. To um, talk more about how great Dirk is. Because uh, I don't want to stop, right? <laughs> I was having dinner with him and somebody else once, and it was somebody that he had criticized in writing. <clears throat> and the other person acknowledged how gracious Dirk was mm. in his criticism. And the other person was a Christian also, and Dirk turned to him. He said, I am planning on a spending eternity with you. <laughs> yeah, that's great. John Newton wrote a letter on controversy that I've thought about a kabillion times over the years, and he said the same thing. Just remember, you're about to enter controversy with a fellow Christian in public. You're going to spend eternity worshiping yeah. with them. We have, and and if we believe in that gospel that we say is the center of our faith, we go back to that first session, we have to believe that we don't have anything that we didn't receive, including proper doctrinal understanding right. and that ought to flavor our work with humility you know what if you hear people representing the position of the textual confidence collective 
hereafter the TCC, and they're doing it in a bitter and nasty spirit, they are none of ours. Mm -hmm. That's not us. We want to show continuous grace. And I have to say, in our private conversations, we are asking each other to help right. with that sort of thing. Right. Should I even respond to this person? How can I be gracious? Should I say this? That's, that's yeah. one thing that really has drawn, drawn me to all of you that like Likewise. all of you have, have done that. Like I've been less engaged in the online scene just because I'm very busy with my pastoral duties and, and for other reasons as well. Um, but just all three of you have written to our group that we message back and forth on. Should I say this? Am I being yeah. too harsh? Am I yeah. being uncharitable? I, I, I want, I need insight, you know, like I don't want to judge myself to be in the right right, and right. assume that I'm doing things. And I just, right. that has drawn me to you all. And I'm just likewise. You know, and, and I'll, I just want to say there one thing too. It ought to be the case. If people are desiring to be led by the Holy spirit, that they are less concerned with someone's position on an issue or what argument they're making and more concerned that they display the fruit of the spirit that Paul talks about in the yep. way that they talk and argue. And the same thing, I've become friends, close friends with each of you in a large measure because I've seen that fruit in the way that you've talked about this issue and you haven't given into the temptation to make the issue more important than the spirit whose fruit you're supposed to display. I'm always, I feel like 90% of it is me being grumpy in the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're grumpy out. Grumpy Elijah, yes, new nickname. Yes, yes. At least you, you listen to us though. John Newton. What will it profit a man if he gains his cause and silences his adversary, if at the same time he loses that humble, tender frame of spirit in which the Lord delights and to which the promise of his presence is made? That's been on my mind and heart, and I can tell on yours, uh, and I agree. I mean, this is why this is why I work with you guys, and I've been so incredibly amazed and grateful and also not surprised at all that a ton of ex-King James only who've contacted me have been sincerely grateful for the good they received within King James only has been exactly the ways yes. that we are and, and yet have been able to distance themselves from it. Even people who've suffered, I, I can't think of anybody who suffered more than Tim and Peter from this, but even people who've suffered that kind of family break have done that and God help us all. Insofar as we're trying to lead something, a movement, if you even want to call it that, we want to lead people toward that kind of gratitude, which will be disarming. And we're praying over the long haul that those parents and siblings and institutions will one day repent and probably yet another day apologize and that Christian unity will be restored. We've gotten way off of the recommended books. <laughs> have a few more to get through. Myths and Mistakes of New Testament Textual Criticism. I reviewed that for a journal. Absolutely fantastic. Elijah Hickson was one of the editors. I really, really love that book. Um, it's kind of humbling because I've kind of repeated some of those myths and mistakes, but thankfully I didn't put them in print. It was just like, oh. you know, personal. I have, and I had to apologize for one that I put in print in a footnote. In the oh, yeah. I think yeah. this this book is... You know, if you want something that goes beyond Dirk, you're starting with Dirk. Right. Uh, Dirk, this is probably the best place to start on text right. criticism. Miss and mistakes would be the next best place yep. to, to go, I think. I just, I want to clarify, we didn't write that as a book on text criticism. Right. We, it's really a book on apologetics. Sure. because Two apologists. <laughs> yeah, we don't, I, you know, I love what apologists do. I have a great deal of respect for apologists. Um, you've got to be an expert in so much stuff, and it's just hard to keep up with everything. And so... Text criticism is particularly complicated, as Peter and I have gotten into a bit, and so we just wanted to have a resource because I I don't think text critics historically have done a great job at yeah being accessible yeah. and for, in that sort of way, and so we, but we that ends that up exist. that ends up making it the latest you know state of the yeah the it's like state right. of the art in right. a way that's really helpful yeah that it's not outdated and so many handbooks are outdated yeah. the other book that's you know has a chapter can we trust the gospels it's an amazing book by pete williams we've mentioned him it's just really packs a lot in a small punch but there's a chapter on you know has the text changed uh, that really you know if you want to build your textual confidence is it's what, like 10 or 12 pages, but it's the single best 10 or 12 pages you could read. Um, <laughs> and so I just put this out there, not a whole book on it, but it's really, really a good book. And uh, yeah, one that I would recommend is that Richard Brash, and I've talked about Richard Brash's book, A Christian's Pocket Guide to How God Preserved the Bible. The chapters are, uh, I had it marked and I lost my place. 
And this yeah. is the book that you say convinced you to believe in a theology yeah, of preservation. I, I had to Changed apologize for him to him for being for reading it with a bad attitude because <laughs> he was right. I was wrong about it. Um, introduction: Filling the gap. Does God preserve Scripture? How does God preserve Scripture? Where does God preserve Scripture? Why does God preserve Scripture? Um, and the whole thing in notes start on page 81. It's like, short. This it's is a great. tiny book. I, yeah. And I just, I love it. Richard Brash is a, he's a, a missionary. Also, he's a seminary professor in Japan, uh, but he's not, you know, he, he's Richard, but he's from Edinburgh. He's a Scottish missionary in Japan. Yeah. And the history of the King James Bible, not only kjbhistory.com, but Tim? Yeah, I'll throw in, it is definitely not if you're looking for like the cutting edge, most recent work on the King James. It's not that. Uh, and it's not the most academic work that's out there, but for someone who hasn't already had a lot of background in bibliography, a bibliographical footprint, and the culture of the era, a great introduction is Alistair McGrath's In the Beginning, The Story of the King James Bible and How It Changed a Nation, a Language, and a Culture. It's the first place I'd point you. Excellent. Now, if you want to go, just before, uh, two, two, two books that we wouldn't definitely endorse them in the way we'd endorse these books and say these are, you know, we agree with everything that's in them. Uh, but if you want to really take it to the next level, you're like, I want to know about text criticism. I want to be able to follow, you know, know all the details. Um, there's two books. And, uh, you know, with what we've said about Ehrman, so this is uh, the text of the New Testament in contemporary research, essays on the status questionis. Right. Uh, now, that book is already 10 years old. So it's still, you know, as recent as, as it is, it is still in a sense dated in some ways. Right. Um, but in terms of like a comprehensive, uh, so, so with what we've said about Bart Ehrman, you'd be very surprised that we're recommending a book that's edited by Bart Ehrman. But there's two caveats to that. Number one, um, as you know, both Elijah and I can attest, academic and, and academic. Have you done an edited volume? Um, like been in one or done one? Done, like edited one? I have not edited one. So when you edit a book, like especially in an academic context, you have zero, you have zero impact <laughs> on what the writers are saying. That it's you have a lot of work to do, but that work does not involve telling people what to say uh, for the most part, other than catching their typos and reformatting their footnotes and doing lots of other really annoying things. Um, <laughs> and so Ehrman writes one chapter in the book. Michael Holmes is an evangelical Christian, and they are lots of the contributors to this book are evangelicals. But even Ehrman's chapter, when Ehrman has to hold himself to academic standards right. rather than writing at the popular level, yep. his writing is a whole lot less sensational, <laughs> as yeah. it turns out. Um, and so, well, even in his chapter in that book, he essentially says, you know what, guys, the text of our New Testament isn't really likely to change much in the future. <laughs> yeah. And so it just, it has, you know, so Pete Williams wrote a chapter on the Syriac version, you know, there's a version, you know, so it just goes through what's a chapter on minuscule witnesses and a chapter on magical witnesses and a chapter on papyri and a chapter on Latin and a chapter on, you know, Latin patristic citations and Greek patristic citations. So it's really, there's nothing, like you said, there are there's been more research done on all of these areas, but there's nothing that's as comprehensive that basically, you know, gets you a foundation in a huge broad range. So I've, I've read through it twice. It was hugely beneficial to me. Um, and so if you really want to, it's expensive. Um, and again, this isn't, you know, if you're an average pastor, I'm not necessarily saying everyone should read this, right, right. Yeah. but if you want to do text criticism, everyone should read this. Right. Yeah. It's, right. it's still the best place to to go for. That. And the other one, also by someone who I wouldn't, you know, in, endorse all of his theological views, but sure. uh, D.C. Parker wrote an introduction to the New Testament manuscripts and their texts. And if you want to get a sense for how manuscripts actually work, um, and especially, you know, just the, the realia, the, uh, the physical realia of manuscripts, I don't know of anything better um, than this book. It's available more cheaply than this one, for sure. Uh, so New Testament manuscripts and their text. And again, these are, these are not the places to start. These books we endorsed and recommended beforehand would be where we would, you know, we want you to start. Uh, but if you really want to understand, if you're thinking, I might want to get involved in this work, then I would say these would be necessary books to be reading. Um, yep. I've called, I've referred to Parker to people as one of my favorite people that to read that I like so thoroughly disagree with some of his conclusions because <laughs> right. he's, he just, it's fascinating. He knows things about manuscripts and I rarely read him and don't learn something new and you don't have to follow him to his conclusions for that. Um, and for, I think we've seen that as yeah. a thread that, you know, in God's sovereignty, if God can use, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, if God, if God can use Cyrus to bring his people, you know, if God can use Nebuchadnezzar to judge his people, yeah. God can use Cyrus to return his people to the land. Um, God can use who he wants to use. Right. And so if God can use someone like Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar, if God can use, 
you know, monks that sometimes got drunk and sometimes didn't keep all their monastic vows. And um, sometimes thanked the mother of God. <laughs> yes, and that too. Um, if God can use them to copy it, then, you know, surely he can use people that maybe we would disagree with their theological conclusions to do some of the work of studying manuscripts and helping us to learn that. And I, I, and I think that's really an overall theme that God is sovereign. We are not. God's God. We're human. And we've got to quit trying to be God and be happy with what God has chosen to do. That's yeah, great. I don't think Parker's a powerful enough to overturn God's right. work. Mm, yeah. You know, we talked to do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Right. right. We, we talked about how to end this, and we were either going to do a musical number based on New Testament textual critical principles, the, the canons of textual criticism, or we were going to do a tribute to S. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, or we were going to have Tim take us out on an interesting little series of uh, events with involving Bentley, Whitby, Collins, and Mills. I thought we were going to talk about cats. No, oh, you're going to talk about four. cats after the podcast by yourself. Yeah, uh, I think that is a great spot for us to come to um, and just to land. We sketched earlier a broad history of textual absolutism and three broad positions, confidence, absolutism, and skepticism. And in the story of the publication of John Mills, 1707 New Testament, we see all three of those views interact with, way, interact with each other in ways that I think have strong resonance with what we're sketching out today as the spectrum. So what happened in... Uh, well, 1675, Bishop John Fell published his Greek New Testament, which I think was based on 80 plus manuscripts, but not as extensive an apparatus. In 1707, when Mill published his from uh, roughly 100 Greek New Testament manuscripts, he's listing now by far more textual variants in the apparatus than have ever been listed before. By one count, 30,000 variants. And when that gets released into the world, a firestorm erupts from absolutist and from skeptics that take this and use it in different ways. Mills himself didn't uh, live long enough to fortunately face much of that controversy. He died shortly thereafter. But a pastor and, and uh, I would say theologian and thinker by the name of Daniel Whitby wrote a response in 1710, very concerned that raising this kind of textual variation to the to public mind would threaten the authority of scripture. Let me read just a little bit from... He published it at first as an appendix to a separate work and then later as an appendix to uh, his commentary. He never published it by itself, which was telling. And he never put it into English, which was also telling. It was always in Latin. But let me read by it from Adam Fox's translation. He says, although I acknowledge, this is Whitby, the divine providence has not so watched over Holy Scripture that no errors have crept in. Yet it's agreeable to reason to suppose that he who established the Scriptures as the sole rule of the church has had regard for this rule in such a way that it should never be inadequate. And we, we can... Here in those words, some similar arguments that we've talked about. He says, I grieve, therefore, and am vexed that I found so much in Mill's prolegomena, which seems quite plainly to render the standard of faith, the Bible, the standard of faith, insecure, or at best to give others too good a handle for doubting. So he throws out this alarm. Guys, textual variation is dangerous. This many textual variants, this is a threat to the authority of Scripture. And what's interesting is who picks up that alarm. One of the guys who picks up that alarm is the deist Anthony Collins. Anthony Collins had made a career of uh, arguing against kind of an orthodox Christian view. And, and what kind of makes this expression so resonant with our own is because it's building on currents from the Enlightenment and this kind of critical thinking that he's bringing now to the text. So he quotes Whitby at length and says, look, even those guys can admit that because of all this variation, the Christian faith's in trouble. So let me just quote what he says. Dr. Mills has published a book containing all the various readings, and they amount accordingly to a late author to about 30,000. And then he cites the paragraph that I just quoted, slightly differently translated. And he says, uh, the vast quantity of various readings must, of course, make the mind doubtful or suspicion that nothing certain can be expected from these sacred books where there are various readings in every verse and almost in every part of every verse. And then he goes on and tells some of that history. So what happens is. The absolutists hunker down with a defense of the TR, and he, he comes almost to defend the perfection of the TR, but that feeds into the skeptics' claims against Christianity, and now Collins can take the claims of Whitby and use them against the Christian faith because they've both seen something similar in the way that they're evaluating text, textual variation. They're seeing it as a threat to the authority of Scripture, and Whitby— has God's revelation in his word, but not his revelation in the world. And so he's 
bulwarking the TR. And Collins can see God would say it this way necessarily as a deist, but can see something at work in the world, but rejecting the authority of scripture. And they're both doing the same thing with textual variation in 1707 and 1710. Along come the classicist Richard Bentley. And Richard Bentley writes a response to Collins and recognizes that they have both got the same kind of thinking, but the wrong kind of conclusions. And he says this uh, about Whitby's claim, quote, the specific text in your doctor's notion seems taken for the sacred original in every word and syllable. And if the conceit is but spread and propagated within a few years, that printer's infallibility will be as zealously maintained as an evangelist. And he wasn't wrong. <laughs> That's why we're talking about textual absolutism in this form today, because that's exactly what happened. But here's what he said. This is Bentley again. Dr. Mill, were he still alive, would confess to your doctor that this text fixed by a printer, the TR, is sometimes by the various readings rendered uncertain, nay, is proved certainly wrong. But then he would subjoin that the real text of the sacred writers does not now, since the originals have been so long lost, lie in any single manuscript or edition, right? Textual absolutism, one particular form, one particular text. No, no, no. The real text, according to Bentley, doesn't lie in any single manuscript or edition, but is dispersed in them all. You talked about earlier Brash's comment. The text is by the manuscripts preserved. Tis competently exact indeed, even in the worst manuscript now extant, nor is one article of faith or moral precept either perverted or lost in them. Choose as awkwardly as you can. Choose the worst by design out of the whole lump of readings. And I just want to end and we'll close with just this short quote from Tregellis, who we've talked a lot about. Tregellis zoomed in on that history, told the story in his account of the printed text. He doesn't use our terminology of textual absolutism, textual skepticism, uh, and confidence, but he's talking about the same thing. And here's what he said about Bentley. Bentley had to steer clear between two points, between those who wished to represent the text of the New Testament as altogether uncertain because of the variations of copies, and those who used this fact of differences to depreciate critical inquiries and to defend the text as commonly printed against all evidence whatsoever. So he's saying Bentley stood in this lineage of textual confidence and recognized there's two dangerous extremes that can come, absolutist and skepticism, and they're both coming with similar presuppositions about textual variance. And Bentley said, I want to stand against both. And I think what all of us in this room would say today is we, like Bentley, recognize that there's dangerous error in both absolutism and in skepticism, and we want to stand against both. Thank you for listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. You can find this podcast on Dr. Mark Ward's YouTube channel, and anywhere else you find audio podcasts. Be sure to visit our website, www.textualconfidence.com.